Good evening, folks. Pastor Mark Kinsley here uh, in my uh, basement study with my wife, Laura, who is on the other side of the camera. And I'm sure the folks wish you were on this side of the camera. <laughs> but you're stuck with me. I'm sorry. Hope that you've had a great day. We're going to continue our study tonight in the books of uh, the book of Acts, chapter 16. I love this section because it introduces us to the first church founded on a European continent. And you can trace the lineage of a whole lot of folks who are Christians today from this church in Philippi. We'll talk about that tonight. Great to have you. Hope that you've had a good week so far and uh, continue to pray for uh, the sadness that has taken place in our country recently. I think of Buffalo, New York and the folks that were uh, sadly on the receiving end of the violence there in Uvalde, Texas. We think about that. We think about the challenges of living for the Lord in a very difficult place. Uh, the, the world's changed so much since COVID. It's been uh, almost palatable. You could just feel it. But God is faithful, and we are to be, and we'll uh, talk about that tonight. But uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you for everyone watching. Thank you that uh, because of your grace and forgiveness, we have a place at the king's table. I think of the Old Testament when David said to an advisor, I is there anyone left in Saul's lineage that I can bless? And they said, well, he had a, uh, a grandson, the uh, son of, of um, Jonathan, Mephibosheth, but who had been uh, crippled in both feet as a boy. Uh, he's still alive, so he brings him in. And, and I think of that, how God uh, used David to uh, make sure that Mephibosheth had a place to eat at the king's table for the rest of his life. In a very real way, the Holy Spirit is going before us, drawing people to His Son, to the Son, to the Lord Jesus. And I thank God for rescue for everyone who's watching tonight. Help us to uh, be faithful in these difficult times. We pray for comfort for those who are suffering, grieving tonight in Buffalo, New York, in Uvalde, Texas, around the country, around the world. We pray for an end to the Ukrainian conflict. We pray for single moms that struggle to make ends meet. And God, help us as a church to not look past the people you've placed among us. Help us to walk through the crowd slowly and honor you with our very best of service. Thank you for tonight. Guide this time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So remember last uh, week we took a, a kind of a break from the book of Acts just to have a time of prayer looking over the shoulder of the Apostle Paul and his prayer uh, requests and and how to uh, continue on in difficult times. But we're back in the book of Acts, chapter 16. And in this chapter, uh, we um, are privy to the Macedonian call, this vision the Apostle Paul has of a man that says, hey, come help us. And so away they go and they travel there. It's uh, Paul and Timothy, Dr. Luke's in tow. And um, when they get there, uh, and Silas was a part of it too, but when they get there, um, they get to a Roman province called Philippi, named after Philip of Macedonia. He was the father of Alexander the Great, who died like at the age of 33. And Alexander the Great had conquered the known world at a young age. And they said after he'd done that, Laura, he sat down on, on the ground and just cried because there was no more people to whoop. I mean, he, was, he was one brilliant general. Uh, and Alexander the Great's father was Philip of Macedonia. And so uh, Philippi was a Roman uh, colony. It was uh, uh, located in um, what we would call modern-day Greece. And it's an interesting town because it was a um, kind of a, a military town, not unlike Colorado Springs. I mean, we have Fort Carson, we have NORAD, we have Peterson Field, we have the Air Force Academy. Uh, we have a lot of military in this beautiful city that you and I grew up in. Philippi was a Roman uh, outpost and lots of military, lots of Gentiles, not a whole lot of Jewish men. And you're going to see that right off because Paul can't go to the synagogue, as was his custom, because they didn't have one in the whole city. 
But God has his contingency plans. When God closes a door, he opens a window. And so we read about it in uh, Philippians. Excuse me, I, I'm thinking of Philippians because that, that's the uh, Church of Philippi. Uh, was a letter he wrote to that church, which is my favorite book in the Bible, which we need to do a series through. But we're in the book of Acts with the origination of the church at Philippi. Uh, we read about beginning at verse 11. And here is Dr. Luke giving you expert travel uh, directions. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of a Macedonian, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. So here is the Apostle Paul, and he's in Philippi. Here's a little background on Philippi, additional by David Jeremiah from the Study Bible I'm using tonight that I'd recommend to you. Philippi was a Roman colony taking the name, as I said, in 356 B.C. from Philip II of Macedonian, the father of Alexander the Great. Philippi was a favorite city of Rome, and its citizens were exempt from provincial Roman taxes. That's probably why everybody wanted to live in Philippi, right? And um, since Paul seemed to prefer to establish ministry beachheads in key regional cities, it should be no surprise that he picked Philippi. So he's there on purpose, and uh, God had directed him. And while he's there, uh, after many days, uh, Dr. Luke says, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customly made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, this is very interesting. To have a synagogue in uh, any city, you had to have at least 10 men that would initiate it, uh, start it, if you will. So it's kind of interesting that in the whole city of Philippi, they can't find 10 Jewish men. It was a Roman, Gentile, primarily populated place. And so oftentimes, people who wanted to worship but didn't have access to a synagogue would go to a place like a river. So here is Paul going to a river and there is someone there, many someones, many women, and he begins to share the gospel. And notice the effect immediately. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. So we know that Lydia was there. Lydia was a seller of purple. Most believe she was a wealthy businesswoman. Because to uh, produce the color purple 2,000 years ago, they would have to extract um, different chemicals and dyes from shellfish. So even to make a garment purple, you had to have the means to secure the, uh, the shellfish and the manufacturing and then the coloring. So most believe she was a wealthy woman. She most likely was a, a Greek, but she was a God-fearer. We've talked about this before. Non-Jewish people who were drawn to initially to the Jewish religion were known as God-fearers. And you say, well, Pastor, that sounds familiar. Why? Well, I'll go back to Acts 10. Remember when Peter is hungry, he's up on a roof, and he, he has this, this vision of a curtain coming down full of all kinds of critters. Remember that? This is my version. And uh, God says, take and eat. He's like, oh, I can't do that. There's things in there I'm not supposed to. They're not kosher. And God says, don't call unclean what I've called clean. Now, he gets to Peter through his stomach. <laughs> I guess that's still a ways to get to a man through his stomach, right? An army, I've heard, travels on their stomach. Um, you need that sustenance. But at the, about the same time, a Roman centurion named Cornelius has a vision of a man and of a man who's going to come and and uh, invite. he's going to invite him to his home. And Cornelius, also a Roman, also a Gentile, was described as a God-fearer, just like Lydia. It meant they had a propensity to be open to uh, the God of the Old Testament, and it was a, a just a hop and a skip to embracing the Lordship of Christ. And God will use Peter, as you know, to connect with Cornelius through a dream. They connect, and while 
Peter is initially drawn to Cornelius because of a dream about critters in a sheet. It's much more than that. God is saying, I also have a plan, not just for you, not to be uh, tied to Old Testament dietary restrictions, but for you to understand, Peter, that I want to reach the Gentiles with the gospel. And Cornelius embraces Peter. Peter goes into his house. The whole household is saved. And God begins a mighty work to the people who were non-Jewish. And all of us who are non-Jewish people in our uh, backgrounds and our nationalities would say, thank you, God, for doing that. Do you know, you'll find this interesting. Oftentimes, Jewish people in our Lord's day would pray a prayer like this. Lord, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile. I thank you that I'm not a woman. Lord, I thank you that I'm not a slave. Isn't that something? They would pray that prayer. I'm not making this up. They would pray that. Thank you that I'm not a Gentile. Thank you that I'm not a woman. And thank you that I'm not a slave. And what you're going to find interesting in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts is the Lord God Almighty through the anointing of the preaching of the gospel and through the drawing power of the Holy Spirit will reach a woman and a slave and a Gentile. Isn't that awesome? That's what God can do. God can reach people that we think are unreachable. By the way, do you have your 10 most wanted list? I mean people that you know or family that you have that you think only a miracle of God would see them saved and I'm going to pray that they will be saved. I encourage you to do that. So here is Lydia. She's a God-fearer, not Jewish by birth, but has a propensity and an openness to the uh, Jewish of God, our Father, God the Father, and will be uh, having her mind and, and heart illuminated by the Holy Spirit of God. Look at Lydia's conversion, this wealthy woman. It's fascinating. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. That's a great statement. The, who opened her heart? The Lord opened her heart. Folks, anything I can talk someone into, someone else could talk them out of. The only one who can open a heart and help someone to see the truth and the validity of the gospel is the Holy Spirit of God. That's why the most important thing you can do that I can do is pray that God would open the minds of those who are blinded to the gospel, Paul wrote, so that they can see. There was a time when you couldn't see. There was a time when you were on the outside looking in and God's Holy Spirit helped you to see Jesus high and lifted up. I read of an atheist once who said, you know, before, and he got saved, he said, before I got saved, I had all these arguments on why there can't be a God, there couldn't be a God, there couldn't be a God. He said, after I got saved, I couldn't remember a single one of them because of the transforming power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Lydia's heart is opened. Notice what happens to an open heart. And when she and her household were baptized, baptized. So they responded to the gospel. Baptism didn't save her or her household, but it was an outward appearance of putting on your jersey for the glory of God. That's why I tell children many times, being baptized won't save you. It's just water, but it's a picture of what Jesus did for you. When you're lowered into the water, it's like Jesus being lowered into the grave. When you're brought up out of the water, it's a picture of his resurrection. And so sure, her whole household responds to the gospel. God touched a whole household. And she and her household were baptized. Notice the immediate desire of her heart. You talk about a transformed lady. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us. Here is Dr. Luke. She begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she persuaded us. Isn't that something? You know, they went to Macedonia on faith. God had called them through a vision. Come help us. Come help us. You look at this, it seems like the man in the vision was really a woman. <laughs> Lydia didn't know when she went to the river that day, Laura, that her whole life would be changed. Her whole family would be changed. Her name would be written in the sacred word of God and be spoken about 2,000 years later by a Baptist preacher in his basement and fountain. When God touches a life, the ramifications are far-reaching. It's really like, 
you think about ripples in a pond, you know. You ever skip stones when you were a little girl? You didn't just throw them at your brothers, right? <laughs> you skip stones. And, but you'd see those ripples, and that's what the gospel does. And you've been, like I've been, caught up in the ripple effect of transformation. And God has uh, saved us and called us to be um, helping others to find Him, you know. Uh, some uh, weeks ago, Dan Wright shared something with me. Where I think we're going to put this on a T-shirt and have a give gift it to our uh, wonderful servants that go out tomorrow, and we'll feed 50, 60 homeless in, in uh, Dorchester Park here on South uh, South Nevada in Colorado Springs. And I hand out tracks with the meals, and people take them readily, readily. But he uh, saw this T-shirt, and here's what the T-shirt said: "Heaven is my home. I'm just here recruiting." I think that's wonderful. So we're going to put that on the back of the T-shirts, have like the uh, Pike Peak Park logo on the on the, on the uh, breast, uh, but have that sentiment. Heaven is my home. I'm just here recruiting. Well, that's what Paul was doing. That's what Dr. Luke's doing. That's what Silas is doing. That's what Timothy's doing. And I love it. And um, there must have been so much joy, so much laughter. God had taken care of the... The apostle and his compadres took care of their housing. Ultimately, I believe Lydia will be instrumental, her and her family, as a foundational family for the building of the church at Philippi. And you can trace, most likely, your own Christian walk way back 2,000 years ago to a lady by a river who had an open heart and acted on what she heard and gave of her resources to help the kingdom of God move forward. I tell you what. Every one of us is important to God's kingdom, and we are connected closer than you think. Well, you'd think after that there had to be a lot of celebration, a lot of joy. I have no doubt about it. Act two. Paul is going to have some trouble coming now. Isn't that how it is in life? Now, it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of div divination met us who had brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. They're on their way to pray. They are intercepted by a demon possessed girl who made her living telling fortunes. Now we read this 2000 years later through our sophisticated mindset. And we think, well, that's kind of backward. Did they really do that? Yeah, they really did that. And, uh, it was a uh, an interest of many people then. It's an interest of many people now. Even though the book of Deuteronomy warns us about uh, necromancers and, and those mediums and do not consult those who consult the dead, we don't need to look at our astrology charts. I, I look to God for my, my direction, not what sign I am. But here's the point. This girl was possessed. In fact, you'll find it interesting when it talks here about her uh, being possessed, the uh, English translation does not really do it justice. When it talks her about her being a fortune teller, really the the word there in the Greek, which is a much more expressive language, says that she was manic in the way that she presented herself. She was frenzied. Uh, she was uh, very noticeable. And she troubled the Apostle Paul for some time. Do you see it? This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did this for many days. You think, well, why didn't Paul put a stop to this from the beginning? Because he knew that he's in a Roman colony called Philippi. He knew that she had, according to this, two owners that had purchased her and then basically uh, pimped her out to tell fortunes in the city of Philippi, and if he initially dealt with her, it would have effects that would be negative to the ongoing movement of the gospel. So there is a bit of a hesitation to uh, see the church get on its feet before he engaged this girl. But it didn't take long uh, for her to um, get on his nerves, right? In fact, um, what's interesting about this is that the demons actually recognize who God is, just as they did with Jesus. Uh, when Jesus steps off the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, uh, he's met by a Gadarene demoniac, possessed with 6,000 demonic spirits, and those demonic spirits will say to Jesus, uh, we know who you are, most holy one. Please do not send us to 
uh, what would have been their doom uh, to hell when he sends them into the pigs. They go off the the hillside and don't miss their doom anyway. But that, anyway, that's another passage of scripture. But the point is, is demonic spirits, they know who Jesus is. They recognized him. They actually tell the truth here. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Did it for many days. Basically think of a kind of haranguing, mocking, uh, hassling kind of tone. Uh, even though the, the terms they use are true, I promise you they were couched in arrogance and defiance and negativity and attack. Um, I liked what Jeremiah says about this. He said, in the Greek, the spirit of divin divination is literally the spirit of Python, the same snake that guarded the famous oracle of Delphi in Greek mythology. Python was killed by Apollo, the god, think small g, uh, mythical god of prophecy. So Python came to be associated with anyone who told the future, equivalent to a modern-day medium or fortune teller. The slave girl was a source of great income for her masters, which explains how mad they're about to get because Paul has had enough of her. Greatly annoyed, the Bible says. He said to the spirit, I commend you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. And when? Got to get to the right page because I, I turned two pages. And when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Evidently, Luke and Timothy were not there when this took place or they'd have been arrested too. Someone had to write the story, right? And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men, now here's why they twist it, trying to get them in extra trouble. These men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up. So now the whole city's fired up. And commanded them to be beaten with rods. And so this is more than, I think it's the second or third time Paul was beaten. Uh, and so is Silas. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison, fastened their feet to the stocks. So basically... When it says beaten with rods, it's the beating appears to have been an impulsive act on the part of the magistrates. The real punishment was yet to come because they put them in stocks, restricting their movement. The irony was that by beating Paul and Silas, who were Roman citizens, the magistrates themselves were breaking the law. That will be very important later on. And this next section, I think we'll save for next time because it is so rich, so vivid, and so much context and content that we'll save it for next week. But just keep reading Acts 16 because you can do the right thing and get falsely accused, find yourself in a place you never thought you'd be before. But one thing I will tell you, you'll never go where God doesn't go with you. Sometimes God doesn't come to get you out of trouble. Sometimes he comes to get into trouble with you. And Paul and Silas will be in stocks, arms restricted, feeling the stinging pain of being beaten with rods. But at midnight, they decide to have an impromptu concert and start praising God. <laughs> I tell you this much, the fastest way out of depression I know is praise. God inhabits the praise of his people. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, Psalms 150. Keep praising him through the pain, through the bad reports, through the negativity, through the hate, through the fear, through the uncertainty, through rising gas prices, through the tumbling stock market and everything in between. Paul teaches me, reminds me, Paul and Silas, that you can sing in any circumstance of life. You'll find it interesting that when Paul pens the book of Philippians, it's one of the prison epistles, so called because he was in prison when he wrote them. 
you got Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. The book of Philippians, 16 times in that book, you'll read the word rejoice. Rejoice. Written in prison, you can rejoice anywhere. You know why? Because you're not alone. I want you to know that tonight. Nikki Cruz, the famous uh, gang member from the New York Street Gang that was saved because of David Wilkerson's ministry back in the 50s, who, as I understand, lives here in Colorado Springs, once said this, a Christian can feel lonely, but they're never alone. And you're not alone. God is with you. And uh, next week, we'll pick up on the rest of of Acts 16. It's thrilling. It's a page turner, which means you can't wait to read the rest, rest of it, so you'll read it before you go to bed tonight. That's smart. But read it every night between now and next Wednesday, and we'll step back into the book of Acts, and we'll see how God saved a woman, saved a slave girl, <laughs> and will save a jailer who was also a Gentile. That's what God does. He's in the miracle working business. Do you need one? Ask him. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege to speak your truth into these open hearts. Fill us with the joy of the Lord and help us to be faithful in season and out, to be on mission and to look for opportunities to meet a Lydia along the way, or maybe even an obnoxious uh, person uh, who needs you because they're demon possessed. And maybe uh, we will intersect their lives and tell them about you. But remind us that no matter where we are, we're not alone because of Jesus. Thank you for that. And bless everyone watching is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Great to be with you tonight. Uh, continue to pray for Carolyn Southworth, who's recovering from shoulder surgery. Others who are facing uh, uh, challenges, physical challenges. Uh, just pray as the Lord gives you uh, prompting. And have a great evening. And I look forward to seeing you Sunday. Pastor Mark Hensley here with my wonderful wife, Laura, from our basement in the metropolis of Fountain, Colorado, saying good night. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.